Bonsoir, bienvenue à cette troisième séance de l'Andi numérique de l'année 2020-2021. Il s'agit de la première fois au 100% en ligne pour le respect des restrictions dues à la crise sanitaire en cours. Et aujourd'hui, nous avons le grand plaisir d'accueillir Conrad Brosens de l'Université de Louvain qui nous présentera les projets Cornelia et la Digital Art History en douceur, Slow Digital Art History. Euh, je vous rappelle que la présentation durera une heure, ce sera en anglais, et ensuite il y aura une demi-heure du temps pour les questions. Et vous, posez, vous pouvez poser vos questions euh, ou dans les commentaires à cette vidéo sur le canal YouTube de l'INHA ou via Twitter en utilisant l'hashtag euh, lundi numérique. Euh, lundi num, désolé. Et je remercie Doré déjà Antoine Courtin qui suivra et modérera les questions et j'en profite aussi pour remercier les services de manifestation et les services de moyens techniques de l'INHA car c'est grâce à eux que ces séminaires en ligne a été possible. Et je vais donc passer à l'anglais pour passer la parole à Conrad. So Conrad, uh, welcome again and uh, thank you for this presentation. I know it's not a simple task to do it online and without seeing the public uh, in front of you. Uh, I just presented you in French, uh, you and Cornelia project. And now I give you the floor for the next hour. And uh, after the, this hour, you, this, after your presentation, there will be half an hour for questions and discussions. Okay, merci beaucoup, uh, Federico. Et euh, merci beaucoup euh, aux collègues à euh, pour l'invitation. Euh, et donc, oui, euh, je vais m'excuser, mais je ne vais pas parler en français euh, parce que je n'ose pas. Bon, c'est comme ça. Um, so, um, so, thank you again for the invitation and also thank you for um, giving me the uh, opportunity to contribute to this Lundi Numérique uh, series. Uh, it's a great um, honor. So um, I'm here to present uh, Project Cornelia. Um, it's a research project funded by the University of Leuven, so that's uh, KU Leuven, um, and also co-funded by the Flemish Fund for Scientific Research Belgium, the uh, FWO uh, Vlaanderen. So I'm PI, Principal Investigator of um, Project Cornelia, um, but it's basically, it's a team um, of people working on the project. So um, we have a couple of art historians. Um, so that's me, Kuhn Brosens. Uh, and then there are two bright PhD students, uh, Jos Behrens and Ines de Prekel. Um, I'll introduce their work uh, later in the lecture. Um, I'm also being joined by my colleague, Catherine Verbert, uh, Professor Verbert from the uh, computer science department, uh, working at the um, human computer interaction research group. Um, I've, I've been helped by uh, Bruno Cardozo, who is a postdoc researcher. He's no longer part of the team, but he has contributed greatly uh, to Project Cornelia. Um, and also there is a one um, PhD student, Huda Lamkadam. Uh, she's also a master in computer science and she's doing a joint master in um, PhD in art history and uh, computer science uh, degree. So that's going to be a, a first for the faculty of arts. Um, and then last but not least, uh, I think each and every project uh, needs a philosopher. And so I'm also really grateful that um, I can rely on the support or that the whole team can rely on the support of my colleague, uh, Professor Fred Truyen. And so what is our mission? What do we do or try to do? We try to facilitate and foster the dialogue between the art historian and the computer. Um, and this is the roadmap of um, the next uh, 60 minutes or so. So this is what we are going to do. Um, the lecture is divided in three parts. So first of all, I'm going to ask or address a very basic question. Why do we need to facilitate and foster the dialogue between the art historian and the computer? So basically in this first part, I'm going to talk about the relevance of this uh, research of this project. And then the second part uh, addresses a second basic question, how can we facilitate and foster the dialogue between the art historian and the computer? And that I will argue is by doing slow digital art history. And then finally, in the third uh, part, 
I'll address another basic question. How does it work? How does slow digital art history work? And so then I'm going to show a couple uh, of proofs of concept. So we start with the first part. Why is it important to facilitate and support the dialogue between the art historian and the computer? Um, basically, I think, um, and especially in this Landy Numeric series, um, of course, I'm sort of preaching for the choir. I think most of uh, the people that are going to watch this video are more or less convinced that digital methods and tools should be part and parcel of art historical research. Um, but of course, there's a whole community of art historians. And um, for the past years, I experienced that uh, there is a lot of resistance, um, that there are believers and non-believers. And, uh, non and that's because art, all kinds of art, but also art history are tied up in narratives of scarcity, singularity, individuality, and exceptionality. That's basically art history and art. And then we have computational and statistical tools and methods. And uh, to a lot of art historians, and not only to art historians, these tools and methods are reductive, simplistic, and uncritical. Basically, one of the main counter arguments against digital art history is the fact that um, it is assumed that these computational tools and methods avoid argumentation and interpretation. So we have believers and non-believers. And then we feel or we see that um, the non-believers often address the digital art historians, not explicitly, but often implicitly, like they identify them as clueless robots, as people that yeah, simply do what the machine tells them to do without critical thinking. And I witnessed that a lot of believers are starting to feel more self-confident as the young field of digital art history is growing. And every now and then you get the idea, and especially when you go to a conference and then you have a coffee break or you have a lunch meeting or a late night bar meeting. And then sometimes the believers of digital art history feel that the non-believers are basically relics of the past and that they're going to be extinct in a couple of years. I think as a uh, project Cornelia, um, that this hostile world's view is unproductive at best. And I think um, that by interfacing the best, the very best of both the old and the new approaches and methods and tools, uh, we can really advance the field. So basically what project Cornelia is trying to do, just like Bob Dylan did more than 50 years ago, is we try to bring it all back home. We try to bring digital methods and digital tools back to art history and the art historian. Also to the art historian that feels a little bit skeptic or is reluctant to embrace uh, digital methods and tools. How are we going to do that? Or how are we trying to do it? Um, by starting with a basic or a art historical question or a cluster of art historical questions. And so the very, um, the, 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 how shall I, the, the, the entrance to digital art history as seen through the lens of Project Cornelia is this uh, question. How can we re reconstruct and analyze the dynamics of social structure underpinning 17th century creative communities and industries in Antwerp and Brussels? so that we can understand the interplay between the ever-changing social fabric on the one hand and artistic developments. So that's one question, but of course, it's a cluster of questions. And so Project Cornelia, we as a team, we feel that we need art historical data to address this question. And we need to collect, model, clean, and warehouse a wide array of big data, biggish data, both attribution and relational data, and data that sheds light on the actors of the art worlds. And then of course, we um, refer to the work of, of Becker, uh, the sociology, uh, sociology of Art, uh, the famous book on sociology of art. So that means that basically we harvest a lot of art historical data and we put it in a database, in the Cornelia uh, database. On this slide, you can see the data model. So the actor is central. And we always link, so each and every document we uh, process, we put into the database, we identify actors and we link actors to actors, actors to groups like the Guild of Painters, actors to works of art, if the works of art are mentioned in the document, of course, and uh, we uh, link the actor to the places where they um, were living or working. 
uh, you also see the, um, the ontological structure of uh, the database. And of course, having a database is not enough. It's a starting point. We also feel that uh, we have to use, but not only use existing digital methods and tools, we also have to think critically about what they are doing, what they are trying to tell us. And from this exercise, we feel that it's necessary to develop and test new prototypes of digital methods and tools that allow us, but also other users uh, in the near future to explore and analyze the art historical data and to find answers to art historical questions. And of course, these steps, these two steps to address the first question, these are iterative processes, and which means that we have to go back and we have to circle back and forth and we have to go back to the archives, we have to rethink the data model, we have to uh, input more uh, data, then we have to use tools, existing tools, we have to test them, then we are trying to develop new tools, but then we need other archival data perhaps to test them properly. So basically it's a slow process that requires a lot of thinking and that requires a lot of uh, reflection. And that's why Project Cornelia has coined the term slow digital art history for the things, for the kind of art history that we are trying to do and uh, promote. Okay, so now we know why we are doing it and also how we are doing it. Um, I think it might be uh, useful and interesting to show that it really works. Um, so I'm going to um, introduce a couple of case studies or proofs of concept um, showing that slow digital art history is in effect uh, effective. And you see that there are three um, things, <laughs> three dimensions um, that I listed. So what does uh, slow digital art history uh, do? First of all, it tackles data issues and I'm going to show you one uh, case study. Secondly, slow digital art history interfaces, close and distant reading or qualitative and quantitative approaches, or we can also say it interfaces the human and the computer. And I'm going to show you two um, case studies. And then uh, thirdly, uh, last but not least, slow digital art history also enhances the adoption and effectiveness of network analysis. And I'm going to show you four um, case studies. Right, so first of all, what does um, slow digital history, uh, digital art history do, do? It tackles data issues. We all know um, when we are dealing with archival sources, with archival research, we have a lot of data issues. And of course, um, the moment you start to model data, the moment you start to model these archival data, um, data modeling is always an act of violence, right? You decontextualize the 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 the, um, the embeddedness of data in the historical reality. So basically, it's an act of violence, and so then you put it in a database. So again, you sort of uh, multiply or you run the risk of multiplying the data issues that were already inherent in the uh, original source material. So I listed, I think, uh, perhaps the most important ones, and uh, they are often being used against digital art history. Uh, data provenance is always an issue. Yes, I look at the computer. Yes, and I see screens with results, and I see network uh, hairballs, but what kind of data? Where does the data come from? We always deal with ambiguous data. We all know, and especially in the 17th century, 18th century, that people um, had the, um, yeah, sort of um, the habit of naming their children after the grandfather or after the father and things like that. So that's just one example of ambiguity in archival data. If you have Jan Leniers, who is this Jan Leniers? Because it's, it's possible that at one point in time, there were 15 Jan Leniers, Leniers alive in Brussels. Missing data, of course. Not all archival documents have been preserved, fortunately, in a way, because otherwise it would be impossible to do anything. Um, not all source materials have been uh, preserved. And of course, this is just one uh, volume of the Minutier Central. <laughs> Spent a lot of time in Paris doing um, research in the French uh, notary archives. Quite tough. Um, and of course, it's impossible to process all the data and put it in a database. So basically, we have a lot of missing data. And then data accessibility is always a problem. And of course, now we have this, um, this, 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 this better data principles like linked open data, 
yeah, or the fair data principle, where um, it's easier for users to find the the data and and sometimes even to uh, download the the raw data sets. But often that's not the case. So these are a couple of uh, data issues that um, we often encounter. So and in this case study, I'm going to focus on the source browser. So if you go to the Project Cornelia uh, website, it's simply projectcornelia.be, um, you'll see live tools and then the source browser. And the source browser, browser is basically, in the beginning, I must confess, I wanted to develop this source browser as, a, as like, a, like a telephone book, a directory, so that you can type in a name of a 17th century Brussels painter, and then you get like an identity card of the, uh, of the actor. Uh, but as the source browser and the database took shape, uh, we decided to uh, forget about that idea. And now we are using the platform, the tool, basically to show how digital art history, how art history can or should be transparent about uh, data. So one of the things we really like to stress in this uh, source browser is data provenance. So when you click on the icon on this small i for information, then you get a, some sort of uh, narrative um, informing users what they can access uh, in the source browser. Uh, the moment you try to find uh, an actor, here it's Willem van Leefdael, um, and we uh, try to find him in the guild and parish records. So you press on the um, the looking glass and then you get the result. Um, and then you see his name, the baptism date, the marriage date, the funeral date, uh, and then other metadata like the city, the parents, the godparents, but also always the source. So the moment uh, users want to know more about this Willem van Leefdaal, they can always go back to the archive and check the source. And or, depending on the uh, copyright issues, of course, they can also click on a little um, icon in the source browser, um, and then they see an image of the archival document, um, and it's perfectly zoomable. So basically, people know where the, that little piece of data comes from, and they can always check for themselves, sometimes um, just at home. Missingness. That's also something that's really important. So the moment you um, try to build a telephone book, like I was um, trying to do in the beginning, you have the reflex of sort of, yeah, throwing away the people that are a little bit um, embarrassing because you know that these people existed because they are mentioned in documents. But in this case, Johanna uh, van Kutsum, Michiel van Kutsum, Peter van Kutsum, we know that they were living at one point in Antwerp and possibly dealing in tapestries or dealing in, in paintings, but we don't know when they were baptized, we don't know when they were married, we don't know when they died. But still, it's not because we don't know all these facts that we have to exclude them or can exclude them from the, uh, the database. So basically what we are now doing is we show that we don't have the data. Yes, this person is mentioned in one of the um, archival documents, but that's all we know about them. And also ambiguity. There's also something that's really important, of course, because, um, and especially in 17th, 18th century documents, van Kutsum, um, sometimes you have van Kotsum, sometimes you have van Koutselaar, because people, yeah, there was not a single way to um, write or record a name. So basically what uh, we're also doing is we have this disambiguation tool where if you start to type in words like Kutsum, the machine, uh, so to speak, tries to find um, names that are similar to or sound similar to. And that also gives a lot of uh, room for serendipity. And the moment you start to type in a name, you get a suggestion. And sometimes a lot of these people are not really relevant, but then sometimes just by going through the list, you start to realize, oh, that might be him or that might be her. Accessibility, data accessibility is also really important um, because we have this uh, data set and the front end, the browser, um, allows users to um, explore subsets of the data. But we also want to give, and especially the domain experts, so the colleagues, the art historians, the opportunity to really dive deep and really um, explore and analyze um, everything we have in the database. 
And so that's why we also have this, the back end, so to speak. So you need a, a login um, to have access to this, to the database uh, manager where you can write SQL queries and where you can basically play with the data as you um, want to. Um, the source browser has been uh, developed by Bruno Cardoso, so the postdoc. Um, the postdoc and Bruno Cardoso also did something really, really fun and interesting, I think. Um, he made, um, I think uh, most of us know the, um, um, the Minecraft game where you can build um, worlds with blocks using blocks. And then it's also a multiplayer game. So you can, you can do multiple uh, endless things with, uh, with, with uh, Minecraft. And so Bruno used a Minecraft-like engine basically to build a world of blocks, but basically these blocks, that's the data, that's the database. So basically this um, cubism, we call it cubism, this uh, game of data allows users to walk through the database and basically just like you're walking in a library to pick a block or a book and put it somewhere. And also you see all, the, all these uh, operators, so you can also ask very playfully and intuitively you can ask really difficult questions like how many brussels painters were living in that parish and how many of these painters had sons that were also baptized in the same parish so that you can see where these creative communities in brussels were located and you can see if and to what extent people or artistic communities moved throughout the city and these are really difficult sql queries Right? But if you can play with the data, if you can play with the blocks, it becomes more um, uh, accessible. Uh, and I'm really proud to say that uh, we managed to publish the, um, an article on cubism in this recently uh, published book, uh, The Rutledge Companion to Digital Humanities and um, Art History. So for those of you who want to know more about cubism, there's also a demo on the website. Um, and then uh, Bruno did a lot of user testing, uh, addressing issues like, uh, do you enjoy it working like this? Do you find it um, entertaining? Do you find it engaging? Is there room for serendipity? So basically a statistical analysis of the, um, of the user behavior. Okay, so that's one thing that slow digital art history does. It tackles data issues or it aims to tackle data issues, of course. Then secondly, um, slow digital art history also tries to interface close and distant reading. So basically the, um, the bird's eye perspective on data. So trying to get a, uh, an overview of the whole landscape and then the really tiny microscopic reading of one single document. I'm going to show you two uh, very similar or complementary case studies. Case study number one um, has been developed or uh, Jos Behrens, one of the PhD students, took the lead in this um, case study. What he, and, and basically it was a group effort, but he took the lead, uh, it's a distant reading of the careers of Brussels painters, 17th century painters, seen through the lens of the guild regulations. So basically we have a register of Brussels painters, uh, but also the gold beaters and the um, stained glass makers. They were in the same corporation. And so basically we have lists of apprentices and masters and deans. And so we processed all the data, put it in a database, and that allows us to have a better understanding of the uh, development of the Brussels artistic landscape throughout the 17th century. And Brussels, of course, is part of this huge production complex that we now know as Flemish Baroque painting. Um, and so basically it was an, it took us a long time to process the, um, the entry lists, the entries of apprentices, masters and deans. Um, and we spent, I think, days and days uh, cleaning the data because again, sometimes these um, names are similar or identical. Um, sometimes they're hardly readable. Sometimes they are written in, in a couple of different spellings that we feel or think that must be the same person, but do we know for sure? So it took us a long time to clean um, the data. But then uh, the result was really um, nice, I think. It allowed us to really see and really uh, try to understand the, the nature of the development. So then we see, for example, that 
the number of master painters on the left and the blue, uh, the, the number of master painters stayed more or less um, equal throughout the 17th century, while the number of apprentice painters dropped ever so slightly throughout the 17th century. And that is something that basically nobody ever um, realized. And then if you start to zoom in a little bit more on the, so that's basically the whole uh, landscape. And then we can zoom in on the careers of Brussels painters. Um, and then we see that only 25% of the apprentices made it to master. So there was a huge dropout rate. And then only 40% of all masters trained um, one or more apprentices. And basically only 10% of all masters trained about half of all apprentices. And only 20% of all masters became dean. And so basically, these are the high profile artists, of course. These are the usual suspects. Uh, if you look at um, art histories of 17th century Flemish and Brussels painting, you'll usually find names that fit that profile, the higher profile painters. But, and this is really important, I think, we also realized that among these privileged group or high profile group, there were also a lot of overlooked painters. So painters that have never been addressed properly in the art historical literature. So basically what this kind of approach allows us to do or what it reveals, that's path dependency. We all know how um, art history, but not only art history works. If you have a, uh, if, if somebody in the 1920s published an article on a painter, then chances are that there's going to be a follow-up article and then other people start to um, write articles based on the other articles. And so, so there is this one painter that pops up in the 1920s, uh, for example, and suddenly he becomes a big shot in art history, while a lot of other painters have been uh, overlooked. And this, of course, also ties in with this confirmation bias that people start to attribute a lot of paintings to painters that are already known. Um, so basically, this kind of approach, it, tells us a lot about the evolution of the artistic landscape in Brussels, but it also helps art history to find gaps. And I think that's also something that's really important. If you want to know more about this research, uh, we published um, the results in the Zeitschrift für Kunstgeschichte uh, in 2019. Case study number two, the complementary case study, uh, Ines de Prekel, uh, another PhD student, took the lead in this. And she is doing something very similar. She's doing to do, she's going to do, or she's doing, she has done basically distant reading of careers of Antwerp painters seen through the lens of the guild regulations. And so she manages to find a, or to um, reconstruct the artistic landscape in 17th century Antwerp. And of course, it also helps us to understand the Flemish Baroque painting uh, production complex. And you see similar lists people that entered the guild as an apprentice, a master, or a dean. And again, it took a lot of time to process all the materials. And here, um, the article has been submitted for peer review, um, and I think we'll uh, expect the reports any day uh, soon now. Um, so, but what we, one of the things we discovered, so there is this idea in art historical literature that um, Antwerp went through uh, an economic decline uh, from about 1650 onwards, and that also uh, consumer preferences changed uh, from about 1650 onwards. And that basically the uh, Antwerp painting that was so uh, world famous in the first half of the 17th century sort of woof, dropped uh, completely in the second half of the 17th century. By processing uh, all the data, we discovered that um, there was a remarkable resi resilience of the guild engineered by the master painters. So they knew what they were doing and they used the freedom offered by the guild regulations to machinate. So they really controlled the number and careers of apprentice painters. And also they followed the Brussels example and they also founded an academy in a successful attempt to uh, recruit young and aspiring artists. And we also discovered that small workshops were and remained the norm. And these are all um, people that are familiar with the debate on 17th century painting and production and, and um, supply and demand, these are really, I think, I believe, uh, really interesting uh, contributions to that um, debate. All right, so these were the two case studies where we try to show that it is possible to interface the close and the distant reading uh, approaches. And then uh, last but not least, slow digital art history also 
I believe, enhances the adoption and effectiveness of network analysis. I'm going to show you briefly four case studies. Network analysis, that's really something that's really tricky because the non-believers, usually the non-believers, they find proof in these networks, in these hairballs. If they say that computational and statistical tools and methods are reductive, that's simplistic and critical, that you put a lot of things together and then simply stir and then suddenly something magic happens, but you don't, you're not capable of thinking properly about it. That's the network um, analysis. So there's a tricky, that's the Achilles heel, I think, of digital art history to a large extent. I think by uh, thanks to the data model, um, we are uh, capable, I think, to reduce clutter and noise. So basically we can uh, project or reconstruct networks, but since we've been um, slowly processing the data, it is possible to make the hairball or the network as effective and as economical as possible. And for example, we can uh, transform a multiplex baptism network. So on the left is a baptism network. The child is in the middle. You have the set of parents, and then you have the set of uh, godparents um, below. And of course, all these people are related uh, to each other. And the, the, the nature of the ties are all a little bit different. The father, child, the child, uh, mother, husband, wife, godfather, godmother. Thanks to the data modeling strategy, we can basically transform this hugely complex network first in a uniplex network showing godparenthood ties. So we got rid of all the um, abundant ties like husband, wife, things like that. But the godparenthood ties, that doesn't tell us everything we no, it tells us a lot, but it tells us too much, basically. If we want to know more about godparenthood strategies, which is really important, I think, then we don't need the child. And the child was simply born and suddenly he or she got a couple of uh, godparents. And so basically, then we can um, work with this simple uniplex network showing godparenthood strategies without losing the data that the document provides. Because for... Um, some questions, it might be really important to know the other relations. This is just an example of godparenthood strategies um, transformation. Case study number one, um, developed by uh, Clara Allen and Astrid Slechten. Uh, they were the first generation of um, um, students and researchers working on Project Cornelia. Um, and they managed, um, they took the lead in this case study, they managed to reconstruct the evolution of godparenthood networks developed by Brussels and Antwerp tapestry entrepreneurs uh, between 1620 and 1680. And so we have three snapshots in time. And you see on the left, the first phase, 1620, 1640, Brussels below, and then Antwerp top right corner. And you see that there are no godparenthood strategies or ties between Antwerp and Brussels. And then suddenly, around 1650, things change completely. You see all these Antwerp and Brussels clusters meeting in the middle, so to speak. So we get Brussels tapestry producers that have a child, and then the child, the godmother of the child, is an Antwerp uh, tapestry producer, things like that. And then near the end of the 17th century, again, we see a divide between Antwerp and Brussels. And so basically, this is what the data tells us. And interestingly, because we are art historians, this kind of, um, these networks, basically they allow us to revisit attribution and dating issues. We have a couple of, or a lot of, uh, very difficult um, seven, mid 17th century Flemish tapestries that look like they were woven in Antwerp, but they were based on the Brussels cartoon, or they seem to have been woven in Antwerp, but they have the Brussels border. And sometimes they even have a Brussels mark while the quality or the color, yeah, suggests that it's actually an Antwerp piece. So basically by realizing how these producers um, were connected by godparent to ties, ties of family and friendship, and also economic ties, um, we can, reading some of these attribution and datings. And also we can even start to question our, yeah, the, the ingrained ambition to distinguish between Antwerp and Brussels as production centers. That's what art historians are trained to do and like to do. We like to assign labels. This is Antwerp, this is Brussels, right? But perhaps, and that's something that the slow digital art history approach um, suggests, perhaps it's not the right question to ask. Perhaps it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a 21st 
21st century question, but the 17th century or the mid 17th century reality was something completely different that sort of um, escapes this kind of thing. Um, if you want to know more about uh, this case study and also about the um, Project Cornelia, uh, this has been published in a special issue on digital art history uh, in visual resources. Case study number two, uh, also by Clara and uh, Astrid. At one point, they um, started to focus on the, the position and the role of women in these Antwerp and Brussels networks of tapestry entrepreneurs. Again, it's the distant and the close reading, and then also with the network approach. And they found that uh, married women participated frequently and fundamentally in the management of the workshops and the entrepreneurial process. And they also took business decisions. Um, so that's why they were important, but they were also important because they often initiated and guaranteed cohesion both within uh, intra-city, but also intercity production and trading networks. So basically, if we want to understand how the industry existed and survived in the 17th century, uh, il faut chercher la femme, basically. Um, this has also been published also in, a, uh, in an issue of the Zeitschrift for Kunstgeschichte. And at this point, I would like to um, stress something else that I think is important is that um, there are a couple of really interesting and, and fascinating and, and, and really good um, journals that focus on digital humanities, digital art history. And these are, um, and I would like to publish one day in one of these digital humanities, digital art history journals. But at this point, I think it's also important to, again, trying to uh, bridge the divide between the believers and the non-believers to show and to publish in, yeah, more or less traditional art historical journals. And that you can basically sort of bring digital art history to an audience of people that even that don't even realize <laughs> they are doing or reading uh, digital art history. Case study number th number three, uh, the network approach that is currently being developed uh, by uh, Jos Behrens again, PhD student. He has already um, um, presented some uh, first findings uh, at an international symposium uh, a couple of months ago, and he's focusing, and that's one of the chapters uh, of his PhD defense. Um, uh, of its PhD dissertation and the defense will uh, hopefully happen in a couple of months. And he has been focusing on the uh, the painters of the uh, the Brussels yeah, Zonewoud, the Forêt de Soigne, and near Brussels, one of the biggest forests. Um, and we have an endless row of basically around mid 17th century Flemish landscape paintings um, that are often attributed to two or three painters. That's the path dependency again. And what Jos is trying to do, uh, he's trying to reconstruct and disentangle these networks of all these uh, 17th century Brussels painters. Um, and that will help him or that will sort of guide him in attributing um, some or re-attributing uh, some of these uh, Forêt de Soigne landscape uh, paintings. So there you see that the computational approach uh, supports uh, traditional connoisseurship, so to speak. And then uh, the last case study, uh, but a very important one, uh, is case study uh, developed. Okay, I call it case study, but basically it's an it's a it's more than just one case study. It's it's an ongoing work uh, by Huda Lamkadam, um, the other PhD student working project Cornelia, um, and she's a master in computer science. So, which is going to get a joint uh, PhD degree, art history, and um, well, I should say computer science and art history. And she has been uh, reading and thinking a lot about what do humanity scholars um, want or how do they respond and react when they see um, networks basically and how can we try to develop new tools new prototypes of network visualizations that actually help um, art historians to understand what's going on and to accept that yes um, the digital can be uh, of use. So basically, I'm showing you a couple of screenshots of uh, prototypes she has been developing. Um, and I'm really proud uh, to say that she managed to get a full paper uh, at the, um, at the uh, most recent IEEE VIS um, symposium, um, where she was um, in the theory section and presented her work on the layers of meaning uh, framework to reduce the semantic distance of visualization in uh, humanities research. Um, I didn't 
know that the IEEE EV was that important, but it seems to be a really, really big deal uh, in the land of uh, human computer interaction research. So I think um, that's really great that you managed to uh, get this um, published and also presented uh, at the FIS 2020. Um, this is also something I would like to um, stress, and I think by now it's clear that um, slow digital artistry, and I think all kinds of digital artistry, that's a collaborative effort. Uh, you cannot do it all by, I mean, you can try to do it by yourself, but then it will take ages and ages to do something properly. So it's a collaborative effort. And it's also, I think, an, um, it's really nice to see how this has become an, an international community. Um, and so Project Cornelia is one of the teams that has been selected to participate in this Getty Advanced Workshop on network analysis and digital art history. And you see uh, Huda again. So we had, yeah, we had one face-to-face um, uh, -face meeting in 2019, but then of course with the um, COVID outbreak, we are now having online convenings, online workshops. And it's really fun to see um, how all these different um, research teams, and sometimes they're working in a museum, sometimes they're working at a university, it doesn't matter how all these art historians are trying to deal with the network metaphor and trying to um, use the network to make, to build a solid um, argument. So that's really great. And I'm really thankful that we can uh, participate in this um, workshop. Which brings me to the final slide um, of this presentation. So hopefully uh, by now um, it's clear that slow digital art history uh, is basically deeply critical. Right? It produces epistemological questions. What is data? What do we know? What can we know? Uh, it produces new disciplinary insights and the attribution of the, uh, the mid 17th century tapestries, the attribution of uh, 17th century Flemish paintings, landscape paintings. It also produces new disciplinary questions because sometimes, um, sometimes the visualizations or the data analysis suddenly makes you realize that oh, something's happening here. And you see a pattern, you see a trend, and it's the data that comes first and then the question that comes later, basically. That's also something that a lot of art historians, traditional art historians, find difficult to grasp, the idea that data comes first and questions come later. But it is possible and you get new questions. And of course, slow digital art history, I think, also produces uh, critical en engagement with digital methods and tools. If you do it slowly, you don't simply accept the network visualization, you don't simply accept the data set, you question, and you question deeply what kind of data, what, what, what is the data provenance, um, what is this uh, network trying to show me, and what kind of data does it use to make this argument. So basically, it produces a lot of things. And I think at the same time, it develops and refines. It develops and refines the conceptual and also the intellectual frameworks of digital art history, but also art history, and then the wider field of the digital humanities. Okay, so um, that was my presentation. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, questions. Thank you, Conrad, for this inspiring and really amazing presentation. And I think all people that follow that follow you from home are virtually clapping for you. So, je me permets aussi de parler en français car je sais que tu comprends très bien le français. Et je passe donc la parole à Antoine Courtin qui a collecté les questions en ligne euh, pour voir s'il y a des questions qui les publics souhaitent poser euh, à Conrad. Oui, merci beaucoup Conrad pour ta présentation. Euh, quelques questions euh, également en ligne. Euh, Puis-je me permettre de les présenter en français Oui, évidemment. Euh, première question euh, concernant euh, la place du philosophe euh, dans, euh, dans l'équipe et euh, à, dans quel stade euh, ce philosophe intervient-il dans le projet à la conception tout au long Voilà, un petit peu le, la, le, le rôle et à quel stade se situe le, le philosophe qui n'est pas euh, du tout une, entre guillemets, une, une habitude euh, pas très courant euh, en France dans des projets euh, comme celui-ci. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. Donc, je vais répondre en anglais. C'est OK? Merci. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I understand the question. It's not... But um, my colleague, Fred, uh, Fred Tryon, so the, the, the philosopher, he um, already back in the 1980s and early 1990s, he was an early adopter of computational thinking. Let's put it that way. So he has always been interested in this um, yeah, field of tension between what can we know, what do we know, how do we know things on the one hand, and then a machine that comes into play uh, on the other. So when I had the first, well, basically, when I tried to develop a database myself, because that's usually how it happens, right? I was a postdoc doing a lot of uh, research uh, in Paris, happy days, um, doing a lot of research in Paris, and I wanted to build a database. but. Then, of course, yeah, with the Excel, and then you try to access and you feel that it's not OK. And unfortunately, um, I knew Fred, and I went to Fred. And I said, Fred, can you help me? And he said, I can help you. But first, we need to discuss. <laughs> we need to discuss what do you want to do? What kind of data do you have? What kind of questions do you have? And what kind of future do you see for the project? And so based on these discussions, well, discussions, we had lunches and dinners, <laughs> which was quite nice, of course, coffee meetings. And then uh, we started to see that, okay, this is really useful. This can be a uh, productive collaboration. And so basically Fred, well, Fred is the mastermind behind the data model, so to speak, and especially the idea that it's always a, uh, a moving target. Um, and so um, and now throughout, the, as we, um, we started to collect other kinds of archival documents, we always went back to Fred and we had multiple discussions about this kind of, of, of about the data ambiguity, the dating missingness. How can we, how can we actually, uh, how can we operate, no, how can we make it operational in a way? Um, and so he's still, I mean, yeah, I think now the, the past couple of months, um, but also with the crisis, it's, it's, it's often difficult to have, uh, no, we're not allowed to have lunches. So <laughs> unfortunately, but we still have meetings, of course, and Zoom meetings or, um, so, but it's really interesting because he's always the, I think he's the most critical reader of the drafts we are doing because he's basically he's an insider, but he also has the uh, ability to look at it as an outsider. And again, I think each and every project, perhaps it shouldn't be a philosopher necessarily, but somebody who is really knowledgeable about the field, but not really completely fossilized in the field and that's really so i'm really grateful that uh, that fred has helped me in the beginning and still helps us ah, okay donc une hauteur de vue une hauteur de vue euh, pour voir les, les, ouais. les différents projets euh, merci pour votre réponse je me permets on a cinq six questions donc je me permets de, de ouais. te les livrer euh, une question euh, récurrente euh, qui est habituelle au lundi numérique euh, comment concilier ce, ce slow art Art History, que tu revendiques, et euh, les questions du financement, mm. money is money, euh, notamment euh, euh, en regardant la timeline de votre projet, euh, qui a maintenant plus d'une dizaine d'années. Euh, et donc, est-ce que, euh, voilà, comment se passe, euh, comment concilier la slow art history avec la réalité euh, du financement euh, en mode projet qui est de plus en plus euh, la norme euh, à l'échelle européenne. Merci pour uh, cette question. Um, and it's literally the million dollar question in this case, right? It's um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think the presentation shows that as a PI, yeah, you're trying to supervise the team, but I think I spent most of my research time drafting applications for funding agencies. And that's, that's, yeah, that's the main part of my job right now, which is okay, which is okay. Um, I found that, um, because I, al I also try to understand the, how other digital art history projects were financed and how they were managed and controlled. And at one point I realized that at least here in Belgium, perhaps I have to be in Belgium and then especially in Flanders, um, the key is you have to publish you have to publish and publish and publish. So you can have a fancy website, you can have a huge database, you can have splendid visualizations, and you can, you can really help a community of art historians with a digital art history project. But if you don't have publications in internationally renowned double blind peer reviewed journals, then you won't get um, additional funding. So publications, um, that's really key. 
So that's one of the things I am trying to do. And, and, and um, I think also the presentation made clear that I'm trying, that I see the project as, as, as building blocks, right? So, and every now and then, yeah, we, we, we sort of, yeah, pass <laughs> a very difficult question because we think at this point, it's really too difficult to do it properly. So like the cubism game, for example, the game of data, I truly believe that at one point we should try to develop it. It's, it's really something, I think it's amazing. I think it's, it, it holds a lot of promise. And also, and of course, also the work of the artist, but, but this, this cubism tool, that's really something. Uh, but it's really expensive to do that. And at this point, it's going to be difficult to get funding for this game of data. So, but then of course, there are different ways to, um, um, to go about it. Um, um, and you try to see what the, on a European level, right? Uh, people are finding interesting to fund. Um, and then you go and you check the other funding programs like the cost applications, for example. And so what I'm also trying to do is to, again, use this as building blocks to support an application and then also try to make sure that in each and every application, even though it's not really about Project Cornelia as such, that there is some sort of, um, yeah, some sort of link to the, to the Project Cornelia project as a whole. So, and of course, yeah, um, the, the, the overarching research question, uh, what is the interplay between social uh, dynamics on the one hand and artistic production on the other? That's so wide that you can cover a whole field basically, but it is really, it is really difficult uh, to keep the uh, the funding going. But I think also, so the the <clears throat> a couple, well, I think last year we also redesigned a website, for example. We redesigned a website, and now it's really a program, um, a, a project website. And the moment the funding dries up, and and at one point I fear that the funding will dry up, of, of course, then it is what it is. Then you get a timeline because on the on the project uh, website you see a timeline of presentations of publications of events uh, of, of of demos that we uh, put online and so that'll be that'll be the legacy it's the 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 um, the website and then of course the well it's not a body of publications but still we already have a couple of uh, publications that sort of support that's the more traditional um, support so to speak of this website and of course the database will always be hosted by the um, University of Leuven. So we're never going to lose, and I think that's also really important if you start and try to manage um, a digital art history project. Uh, and that's one of the things, the, the participation at the Getty uh, workshop, the uh, Network Analysis and Digital Art History uh, workshop has uh, thought us, uh, because then you also start to realize that ooh, at one point this is going to end or how do the other teams deal with this kind of sustainability uh, issue uh, for example, um, and we had some nice uh, talks and workshops about this kind of uh, data management plan, about this kind of sustainability um, strategy. I don't know if it answers the question. So yes, it's really hard to get funding. <laughs> yes. Tout le monde. Non, tu as tu as très bien répondu et ça me permet de de, de continuer sur deux autres questions que je me suis permis de, de combiner. J'espère que ceux qui ont posé la question m'en tiendront pas rigueur. Et tu l'as déjà un peu évoqué. C'est la question de qui, qui va peut-être à l'encontre de ce que, tu as, ce que tu as dit, mais euh, que deviennent en fait les sets de données, les jeux de données, euh, après l'étude, après la publication que tu as montré en cas d'étude euh, Est-ce que c'est associé à un dépôt sur Zenado ou sur autre euh, plateforme de, de données mais, tu as déjà un tout petit peu évoqué sa question. Euh, et donc, sur la question de, de euh, la pérennité, finalement, des outils qui sont développés, euh, il y a toujours un, un, un curseur à trouver entre la, la liberté de l'expérimentation et euh, la, la, le fait de devoir créer des outils pérennes pour d'autres, notamment pour des questions de financement que tu as évoquées précédemment. Peut-être sur la question de la de la l'accès euh, parce que l'autre question c'est sur l'accès aux données au delà de l'interface euh, qui est actuellement en place. Est-ce qu'il est envisagé d'y avoir accès par un autre moyen euh, Voilà cette question de de, de l'accès aux données après publication et à des volumétries euh, différentes. 
Okay, I think I understood the question, so I'm going to answer, but if, if I misunderstood, you simply have to say, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. um, so I think if I understood the question is about the, yeah, the accessibility of the, the data after publication or basically the data set. So at this point, the front end, um, I think allows users to access about, let's say 25% or 20% of the whole data set. Um, and that's why we also developed this back end, um, but the back end is only um, accessible for uh, colleagues that we give a login so they can really do what the, with the data, whatever they want. There is a, um, an old plan <laughs> to uh, make uh, data dumps, so to speak, uh, available so that people can simply go online and woof, uh, download uh, everything. Um, there are a couple of concerns. Um, Yes, open access is important, but at the same time, of course, you have to protect the, the work of the PhD students. So that's a little bit of a... So I think the moment the PhD dissertations will be published, um, I think we're going to release them, um, the whole data set as a, as a, as a data dump uh, possibility, so to speak. Also, another plan or project is to go uh, linked data. Um, but we had a lot of really interesting discussions with the computer scientists about the linked open data or the linked data concept. That's really, I mean, at one point I felt that we as art historians, we, we believe in Santa Claus, like, oh, linked open data is going to save the world and linked open data is going to bring art history to the next level. And then all these computer scientists are going like, what, linked data? Mm. No, no, don't go there. So that's 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 something that we still have to uh, have to think about. So basically, if that answers the the first question, I think we'll put the data set and make it fully available at the moment the uh, dissertations will be published. And then um, the second question was about the uh, sustainability or the operability of the tools that we are using. If I understood correctly, yes. yeah, all right. Yes. So, it is. Yeah, so basically, uh, and that's also something I learned uh, in the beginning, I thought that um, computer scientists were there to develop full working tools that had an uh, everlasting life, so to speak. Um, but I rapidly started to realize that um, they are doing, and that's really interesting, I think, they're building prototypes and then testing the prototypes and doing a lot of user studies then publish about the prototype and the user studies. And then basically they move to the next uh, project, the next tool, the next, or they do another iteration depending on. Um, and then of course, all these papers, all these prototypes, they are just like we art historians do. We put it in the library, so to speak. And then it's up to other users to see even to what extent they can make use of the prototypes and of the insights um, generated by the user studies. So, and that's why I also um, stress the fact that it's now a project website. So some of these prototypes, like, like the Cubism game, that's what it is, right? It's a prototype and you can uh, access a demo. You can see the demo and we, we made a couple of YouTube uh, film. And at this point, it is what it is. And then we publish about uh, the Cubism prototype, just like um, Huda has been publishing about her um, uh, network visualization uh, prototypes. Um, so, but we don't have the, and you can say, oh, that's, um, I mean, you can see it negatively. I'm not claiming that we are making tools. We're not building tools. We are developing prototypes that we test and based on the insights, uh, based on the results of this user testing, we hope that we, or in the future, other art historians and computer scientists and developers can build yet better prototypes. And at one point, hopefully, the best prototype will make it and will get funding and become a, a full-fledged um, tool. And we, and of course, in the, when you, like Gephi, for example, is a, is, a, is a very good example of a tool that has been around for many years and that's still being developed. And so this kind of, but that's, that's not something we, we are not a, a team of developers. That's, that's the big difference, I think. Not with Gephi, with, with with what people sometimes expect that we build tools. Sometimes they say, but when you're a digital art historian, you have to make a Google for 17th century art history. And then I, it's, it's simply not possible to do it. You don't have the time, you don't have the funding uh, to do it. So I don't know if that answers the um, second question, Antoine. 
Euh, C'est parfait. Euh, ça répond euh, tout à fait aux, aux, aux questions. Euh, donc finalement, tu reviens sur… Il euh, y a deux choses que j'aimerais euh, remettre en avant. Euh, la question du euh, linked open data comme euh, le monde rêvé, mais euh, il y a un back to the reality, euh, si je peux me permettre l'expression, euh, qui, euh, euh, qui, euh, qui doit être de fait… Euh, dans la tête, dans l'esprit de, de beaucoup de gens qui travaillent sur cela. Et concernant la, la question des outils, euh, donc tu promeux plutôt la réalisation de, de, de prototypes euh, euh, faits sur mesure pour les données et, et, et non un, un, un outil magique, euh, Magic Tools, comme on peut espérer, euh, qui, fait un, un, qui ferait tout euh, pour, euh, sur les jeux de données. Mm -hmm. And also, if I may add, it's really important that we do research on these tools as well, that we try to see how people interact and respond to the tools, because it's based on these um, results that people can build better prototypes and better tools, I think. Yeah. Uh, a priori, alors j'aurais peut-être une question à titre personnel. Uh, concernant, uh, tu as évoqué euh, la délicate question de la mise en données euh, de l'information. Euh, comment, dans, euh, concrètement, dans vos bases de données, dans ta base de données, euh, tu différencies euh, les données manquantes avec l'absence de données issues des sources alors, peut-être que Federico devra traduire ça en anglais. Um, finalement, the, the missing data mm -hmm. and in the other way, uh, an absent data in primary source. Yeah. The difference is... So, the difference between the missing data and the lack of data is... That? Is, it, no? is, it, is it a conceptual question? Like, do we distinguish between missing data yes. and... Um... Yeah, and incomplete data. Yes. Is, is that something that we, because sometimes we know that the data is missing and will remain missing forever because we simply, we know that the archives have been lost. And sometimes we know that we have incomplete data because we know that the data is in the archives, but we still need have to, we still have to find time to get it from. Yeah, at this yes. point in the database, we don't distinguish between, it's, it's an important distinction. And, of, and then again, that's exactly the kind of question that Fred Ryan, as a philosopher, would ask. <laughs> so that's, it's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, because we sometimes, and, and also, yeah, I'm speaking this Euranglais maintenant. So sometimes, I think for a native speaker, incompleteness and missingness and lack and lacunae, these are all different. It's a semantic field, right? And so it depends on Yeah, so, but that's really, and that goes to the heart of, of what we as art historians are doing. And can we say that we, it is impossible to attribute this painting, let's say, or it's impossible to know more about this painting because we don't have data? What do we say exactly when we say we don't have data? Do we mean the data was there but has gone lost? Perhaps the data was never there because sometimes the data, we know that it's there, but it takes time to get it, or we don't know that the data is there. So there are different, different. and what is really interesting is that sometimes when um, reviewers, I mean, of course, when you submit a funding application or a, or a paper, you always have reviewers uh, four. <laughs> you always have reviewer number two, who is nasty somehow. <laughs> and so it's off, that, that's the, the art. Yeah, but you are, it's not complete. And I say, yeah, you're trying to make an argument, but it's not complete. And then I always go like, but about 99% of art history is basically, it's built on incompleteness, but by, by, by Having more data points, you highlight the fact that a lot of data points are missing. While you focus on one data point, it seems that people get bamboozled and, and don't even realize that they are missing a gazillion of data points around it. So that's, so I don't know if it answered the question again. I'm just. <laughs> Et moi aussi, j'aurais une question à titre personnel, si je peux me permettre, Conrad. Et on a vu les données, on a vu des bases de données. SQL, on a vu des, des graphes liés à des réseaux, etc. Est-ce que vous avez aussi une stratégie concernant la spatialisation des données vous, vous avez par, parlé de paroisse, donc de, de parish. Euh, quelle est la stratégie concernant la spatialisation, une démarche cartographique, etc. 
That's an excellent question, uh, Federico. Um, it's one of the things that, um, so you've seen that I showed two case studies by Jos Behrens and only one by Ines de Brekel. And she started her PhD uh, later than Jos. And Ines is now focusing and going to focus exactly on uh, on that dimension. Because we have it in the in the data model and we, we link actors to places. So we know about city, we know about parish, we know about street, we know about houses when we know the name of the houses. And so that's something, but it was premature to present it right now. But it's something we also want to, again, want to explore. Eh? We don't, we are not going to develop a new prototype or a whole new, we're going to explore. Uh, that's how I try to frame it. Thank you, uh, Federico. Merci beaucoup, Conrad. Est-ce qu'Antoine, il y a d'autres questions Je me permets une dernière question, Conrad, sur, sur YouTube, dans le chat. Euh, on a beaucoup parlé de, de données de la recherche, d'exploitation d'articles scientifiques. Euh, la question se repose, se pose euh, sur la, éventuellement sur l'utilisation de ces interfaces, ces prototypes, à des fins euh, d'éducation plus large dans les écoles ou encore euh, des prototypes euh, éventuellement in situ dans les musées euh, qui euh, exposent éventuellement ces, ces, ces œuvres-là. Donc peut-être la dimension, euh, je n'aime pas l'expression grand public, mais d'ouverture au-delà du monde académique. Est-ce que c'est euh, quelque chose que vous avez en tête euh, dans le projet Cornelia C'est aussi, yet again, une excellent question. I think the audience is really <laughs> is really picking up on on ideas. Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's one of the things we. Um, so the next level funding, so to speak, will be really uh, f not really focused, but it's, it, it it has to be yeah, a big work package or component or whatever you want to call it, and that's the outreach. Uh, that's the, the 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 way that all this research uh, trickles down to a public of of interested people. Um, so yes, um, so we, um, Project Cornelia um, managed to get a, um, it's called a seed fund. So it's not a huge amount of money, but a seed fund um, to explore the possibilities of a future collaboration with uh, MIT, the people in, in, in Boston. And that's exactly, um, and then also the spatial analysis will come into play, uh, Federico. <laughs> um, and that's exactly what we're hoping to do there is to, yeah, build and develop an interface, a prototype again, that um, is really based on all the, um, the results of the user studies and to develop an interface that allows a lot of, well, museum visitors to um, explore a collection. And we had some preliminary uh, talks with uh, the museum. And of course they were interested, but yeah, there's a huge difference between the interest and then the final, <laughs> and then the final result. But it is something that absolutely um, is on top of my mind, if only, um, but it's not because, <laughs> sometimes people do it because of, um, well, out of strategic reasons, because they realize that if you want to get, let's say, European money, you need to involve the European public. So you need to reach out to the European public and things like that. But in this case, I think it's really authentic. It's, it's really something we want to do uh, in the near future. And then also, and I think the first part of the question was really interesting, and that's the schools. Um, because I think, I don't know how it is in the rest of the world, but in Belgium, um, Willem, my son is 16 years old and he is, okay with digital, more than okay with digital. But unfortunately, I feel or I fear that they are not learning enough about digital tools, digital methods, digital literacy, digital skills. It's something that, I mean, yes, it is important to know that Paris is the capital of France, but you can easily find it on Wikipedia, right? And you don't need to, you, I, I think that, that the, so, Yes, I think at one point, and it's also our responsibility, not only to publish in these um, peer reviewed journals that nobody reads except 15 people, you also need to think about, and that's why I'm so interested in this cubism, in this game of data, because, and that's really interesting, when Bruno did user studies, he went from age 15, Willem was 15 back then, my son, to let's say 65. 
and the younger, not all young people, I, I, I assume that all young people were going to go Oof, with this tool, that they were going to, because uh, Minecraft, it's intuitive, things like that. But that was not the case. So we also saw that even, all, so it was not a generational gap, which I simply assumed. Um, but that's also strange, right? You should expect a generational gap because we are, yeah, with a generation of, of, of digital natives. And still they, they had problems in, in navigating this game of data, even though they know about moving and by scrolling the mouse and things like that. So they had the basic controls. So that's really something that I felt, that, ooh, but here is something that we perhaps have to do. Perhaps we have to, uh, and that's something I would like to do with Cubism is to make it, to develop it further. But then of course, uh, Bruno will have to help me, but then again, to rely on funding um, and to, yeah, to develop this and to make it uh, so that children can learn SQL queries without realizing they are doing SQL queries, so to speak. Um, so yeah, no, absolutely. So that's something that, ah, so, so much to do and so little time. But that's also something that we would like to do at one point is to really uh, identify target audiences for what we are doing. And I think uh, age 12 to age 14 and perhaps even younger. And then of course, uh, museum visitors, um, absolutely. Très bien. Euh, je me permets donc de clôturer la séance. Euh, encore une fois, merci Conrad. Euh, ça a été vraiment. Je suis ravi d'avoir pu présenter cette euh, séance. Euh, et euh, il nous reste qu'à donner rendez-vous pour euh, la prochaine séance de lundi numérique qui va se dérouler euh, lundi 14 décembre 2020. Euh, ça, il y aura la présentation de Clarisse Bardiot de l'Université Polytechnique Hauts-de-France euh, qui nous présentera les projets Memory Call, environnement open source pour documenter et analyser les processus de création et simplifier la reprise des œuvres. Et donc, encore une fois, merci aux services de manifestation, aux services de moyens techniques. Et je demande donc aux services de manifestation de couper la directe YouTube. Et à la prochaine fois. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci beaucoup.